announcement that our speaker tonight is Mary Jo Augerson. Uh, previously in the marketing, we had Federico Uribe as the speaker for tonight, and uh, we still had some of the printing out around because we printed about a year ago, but about four months ago we changed the speaker because Federico has kind of been rising in stardom, and he had to back out because he had three museum exhibitions this month. Um, so we're very happy to be able to get Mary Jo to speak on eco-art tonight uh, for Earth Week. Um, Mary Jo Augerston is an accidental environmentalist. Her expertise in contemporary activist art and cultural production began with a PhD in art history from the University of Maryland in 2004. Shortly after earning her PhD, Mary Jo moved with her family to Florida. The timing of her move was between two big hurricanes of that year, Francis and Jean. In addition to the aggressive hurricanes, Mary Jo soon began to notice other afflictions to the Florida landscape. Toxic algae blooms in our rivers, coral reefs dissolving off the coast, salt water intrusion, industrial agricultural runoff that pollutes the Everglades, and a serious lack of canopy trees in urbanized areas, among other things. The total, this total immersion steered Mary Jo towards what is now her primary obsession, making a difference for South Florida's environment through EcoArt. To this end, she co-founded EcoArt South Florida Incorporated in 2007. EcoArt is an environmental science-based art that actively engages the community. As president of EcoArt South Florida, Mary Jo has facilitated large-scale environmentally conscious architectural and sculptural installations around South Florida in order to make a difference within native ecology. This organization's work can be seen in Traer Park, the LEED certified Seminole Casino in Coconut Creek, and in Bell Glade, and their work continues to expand as projects are currently in progress for South Florida's five watersheds, each to be finished in 2015. As you can see by these flyers on your seats, Mary Jo will also generously be offering a free guided tour of Michael Singer's sculptural biofiltration wall at the Coconut Creek Seminole Casino on May 15th at 6.30 p.m. If you're interested in attending that tour, please RSVP by email that is listed on the flyer. Uh, I'm excited to hear more about these projects from Mary Jo tonight, so please join me in welcoming Mary Jo Augustine. So if we'll just take a little interaction here for a second, and let me find out how many of you are students with Professor Rockford. No? No students here? Gosh, you could have... Oh, my. Okay, so I, I hear that, you know, attending and writing something about the, the presentation gives you extra, extra credit, so I'm not sure why everybody isn't here from your class, but welcome to those of you all who are here. Um, any other uh, students from the college? Yes? And what, what departments? Are you in the art department or are you in other departments? Art appreciation. Art appreciation and you? Environmental science. Oh, great. Excellent. Any more environmental science people here? Either students or people who are involved in working on the environment? Great, wonderful. Okay. Well, I want to thank uh, Lisa Rockford and uh, Broward College for inviting us to come here today. It's really a pleasure for Eco Art South Florida to have an opportunity to be able to talk to such a great group of people. Thank you so much for coming. I wanted to say that uh, I'd like this to be kind of an intimate exchange. I'm going to be doing a lot of lecture type stuff, you know, art history type stuff. But uh, I really encourage people to raise your hand if there's a question or you have an issue with something I'm saying that you'd like to exchange. So I, I'd like this to be more of a give and take. So those of you who are in the back, uh, you'll see this, the, the slide much better if you come forward. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so if you can come forward, it'd be great. And also it makes it easier for me to have a dialogue with you. Um, you see on the screen today a great lady, Rachel Carson, the author of Silent Spring. Uh, I'm not going to embarrass people by anybody, anybody who has not read her book by asking you to raise your hand if you have or have not. But if you haven't, I really think that it's important for you to do so. 
book is, is almost uh, six decades old at this point. And this particular um, uh, quotation that I have on the screen is extremely apt. Because though she made it in her book, The Silent Spring, more than 50 years ago, the final sentence I think is most important, and that is, are we willing to live in a world that is only partially fatal? Um, are we willing to continue to allow poisons to be in our environment? Are we willing to do so? Kiko art is all about bringing things to visibility. So, so what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to talk about eco art as a form of slow activism. Slow activism is a theoretical term that was developed by uh, British eco artist and theorist Wallace Hine in, a, in a, uh, an entry for a book about 10 years ago, but it's still very, very appropriate, I think, and I'm getting a lot of very bad peeps, and it's supposed to stand so, out. And that that mess. So at any rate, uh, Wallace Heim uh, had talked about slow activism as an approach to art that is part of the whole process art continuum. In other words, art as a process, art as a time-based uh, kind of practice. And eco art is really fits well into this because. The, the projects that you'll be seeing later are, um, are excruciatingly lengthy in execution. And they really have no ending. The whole point of Igor is to make an intervention and then allow the process, the natural process, to take place. Also, it's extremely slow for another reason, and that is because eco art involves huge numbers of people across the board. I did a count, for example, for some fundraising that we're doing for our projects. We have 16 projects now at various stages. And among those 16 projects, there are 36 private companies and contractors that are involved with them. There are 17 state and local and uh, um, government agencies that are involved. And many, many more. So the kind of practice we're talking about is not something that is normally taught in studio art programs. Um, it requires a tremendous amount of patience, and it requires a tremendous amount of strategic thinking and, and action. Um, and it requires a strong intellect and an ability to see through. I think that's the most important thing, to see through. So, I'm going to put this definition of eco art up a couple times because I really think it's important for us to understand how eco art South Florida defines eco art. This is not shared by everyone. But for the purposes of the, the kind of work that Equal Art South Florida is trying to do here in South Florida, this is, the this is the definition that we are using. And I want to read it for you because I think it's important that we try to sort of pay attention to the elements of it. Eco, eco art, which is short for ecological art, is a practice that fuses aesthetics, science, and community engagement. It is inspired by an ecological ethic in content, form, and materials. And EcoArt's goal is to, to develop respect for, stimulate dialogue about, and directly participate in the long-term flourishing of ecological health. EcoArt commonly manifests as socially engaged, community-based, and restorative art. So how we're going to proceed today is, first I'm going to tell you a little bit about the organization. Then we're going to take a look at the roots of the work, what are the precedents in our history for the kind of work that's being done today. 
what are some of the kinds of uh, practice that is currently being done today um, throughout, not just in Florida, but everywhere. We gave you some examples of those. Then what kinds of eco art is being done here? Um, and then what are the eco art projects that are completed or in process? And finally, the new eco art initiatives that we're currently seeking funding for uh, in 2013. So, what is Eco Art South Florida? We are a nonprofit. We have a really high profile here in worldwide. And um, we were one of the first organizations to be featured by the state's new um, law, which is called Culture, Bil Culture Builds Florida. We grow our own eco artists, and we have one of our eco artists that we trained here today, Jesse Ellison, raise your hand, Jesse. <laughs> All the way down here from Martin County. Um, we're extremely independent. We're not part of any institution. We, we aren't part of an, um, an academic institution or any other kind of institution. And we we have a scientific basis for selecting our community partners, which I'll talk about in a minute. So our primary goal by 2015 is to have uh, centers for eco art in various stages of development in each of the five watersheds. Now, we're divided up according to political boundaries, like counties, and cities, and municipalities, towns, and so forth. But for purposes of our strategic plan for Eco Art South Florida, we are looking at watersheds as in their entirety. And we are using the South Florida Water Management District um, descriptions of where the watersheds are. Does everybody know what a watershed is? No. No, okay. A watershed is a, a, a lower area that collects water. So it could be a lake, it could be a river, it could be you know any one of those kinds of things. So if you look around uh, around Florida, the major there are many many watersheds, but the main ones, the five main ones, are the ones you see in the um, in the uh, map up here. Uh, so we're looking to uh, find particular communities in each one of those watersheds that have particular kinds of characteristics. And in order to do a scientific approach to picking them out, instead of just wandering around trying to figure out where we're going to go, we actually uh, commissioned a study by Dartmouth College Ge Ge Geography Department, their students and faculty, back in 2010. And they looked at 15 criteria, including Things like where are the endangered species, where are the, uh, the Superfund sites, where are the pollution, where's the pollution coming from that goes into Lake Okeechobee and some of the rivers, etc. But in addition to that, we also uh, picked criteria that had to do with art. So we wanted to see where the arts councils are, where is the population of artists located, what kind of um, activity, art activities going on around um, the uh, state. And did you know that you can find all that out with, ge with ge geolog geographical maps? It's really exciting, it's a wonderful exercise. So what the students at, at, uh, in their class, their geography class at Dartmouth did was they layered these 15 maps on top of each other and the cool thing about the computer is you can look down through all those 15 maps and when, what starts coming out are hotspots. And we have those on the website if you're really into maps, and I hope you are because it's a great way to learn. Uh, you can see the, by color exactly where the best places are to put the art. So again, this was not sort of a casual um, approach to figuring out where we're going to go. So we're very excited. We have uh, projects and, and eco art nodes forming in Martin County, Palm Beach County, uh, and Miami Dade, and we're very anxious to have something happening in Broward. And we're also working with the county over on the West Coast, and we have some interest also down in the Keys. So if we get all, if we get something going in all those places, then I really think we're going to be on the map for eco art practice in South Florida. 
So what are eco-arts uh, precedents? We would not even be here today if it hadn't been for the incredible changes that happened in art during the 1960s and 1980s. And some of the things that happened were, some of the things that emerged were uh, bio art and generative art, land art, performance through fluxes. Those of you all who are studying um, art appreciation will understand what some of these are when you know them, so don't worry if you didn't get it first time out. Installation approaches and social practice. None of those existed before the 1960s except in, in individual artists uh, you know, practice. There were a couple of artists here and there that were doing these kinds of things, but for the most part, there were not movements. All of these became movements in the 1960s. So the first one I want to tell you about is Robert Smithson. Robert Smithson uh, died in a plane crash much too young, a very brilliant artist. And the work that I'm uh, selecting to talk to you about in the land art category is Spiral Jetty. Um, anybody familiar with Spiral Jetty? Good, wonderful. Okay, so Spiral Jetty um, is a very interesting work, and I chose that over some of the others because it has a very interesting connection to post-industrial landscapes. The, the landscape of the Great Salt Lake um, was also a center of oil production in the 1920s and 30s. And by the time Robert Smithson went there, all of that was gone. And what was left behind was an exhausted landscape, landscape uh, left over from that kind of production. The other thing that's really important about it that he, that he really enjoyed and, and was one of the reasons why he chose the spot is that the, the, the Great Salt Lake is salty in, in some parts of it because the United States Railroad Cut, cut off um, access to fresh water. So, human intervention in the landscape was responsible for the salt level in some parts of the lake, and that was the part that he chose uh, to put this work. The other thing is that because it was, it was a very important historical place for the railroad. It actually within. I think five or ten miles is the location of what they call the Golden Spike, the historic, the historic site of the Golden Spike. And the Golden Spike was the last spike that was driven into the track that um, brought the two uh, railroad companies together um, and, and provided a, a complete across the country uh, railroad for the United States. The other thing that he was interested in was that the Great Salt Lake was also the remnant of a prehistoric sea. So all of these things were layered upon, once one upon the other. And I have to say that about land artists, um, both then and now, most of them did not have a particular interest in improving, uh, improving the land. They were interested in the kind of things I'm talking about, history, the kind of the redolence of the, the kinds of uh, past historical um, you know, history of the, of the site. Uh, Joseph Boyce is the person that I've chosen uh, to bring to you for two reasons. One is because he was he was very uh, instrumental in um, expanding uh, performance uh, as an art form. And when I'm talking about performance, of course, I'm not talking about uh, theater in the common sense of, you know, proceeding in March or even uh, an arena type. Uh, th this, these would be performances that would be done out in the open, usually having to do with some particular issue. In this case, in the picture that you're looking at, uh, this was a performance that he did at a wetland that was about to be developed um, next to the Zyger Z in the Netherlands. And when he found out that they were going to be draining the wetland, uh, he immersed himself 
in the wetland and swimming. It's like walking the walk and swimming the swim. And um, this is some, not something that people do. People don't go swimming in swamps, especially not here in Florida. <laughs> so the, here, there, here's an example of the kind of thing that, that has carried on into the present that I'm not going to be talking about more and more, and that is making the invisible visible. Swamps were considered to be wastelands. They were invisible and they were something to be drained and used for um, other industrial or um, habitation for human beings. They were not considered to be anything that was beneficial either to human beings or any other species. So what he did by immersing himself in there was almost like a ritual cleansing of the site and an opportunity to bring it forward and to underscore the importance that it had. He did many, um, uh, many performances of this kind, including uh, um, about deforestation as well. Deforestation in Europe was a has been horrendous. There are practically no um, native forests left in, in, um, in Europe. The other thing that I wanted to bring him bring to your attention about boys was that he also invented something called social sculpture. And social sculpture is, as far as we're concerned in Igor and South Florida, the basis uh, for Igor in the sense that we are sculpting, when we do Igor projects, we are sculpting social systems, working with engineers and architects and environmental organizations and community organizations, none of whom are accustomed to seeing art as a community action approach. So, um, Joseph Boyce actually was the founder of the German Green Party, so he not only was an artist, but he immersed himself also in politics. And um, so this is one of the reasons I wanted you to see him here. Um, another very important artist really helped us move in the direction of installation art, which is very common today, is um, Alan Capro from California. Very, very influential on many eco artists practicing today. This particular work, uh, very early, this was 1961, I think. Yeah, 1961, and again, making the invisible visible. Going to a place of detritus, a place where trash is placed, a place where tires are in huge piles. I know we've seen them, we've all seen this. And we don't like to look at them. We go by somebody because of a big fence and so you don't have to look at them. Alan Capro said, no, people need to see this. So he brings this detritus, this abjection, into the gallery, into the white cube space, so that we all can pay attention and it can be brought into this beautiful physicality. Social practice, another very important uh, movement that began in this period. John Malky was still doing this many, many years later. Um, started in 1985, so going on 30 years now, uh, working with homeless people in Los Angeles, celebrating them. These are, the, these are the detritus of our society, the people who have been thrown away, the people who have been dixie cut. Um, he gave them an opportunity to have voice, to be able to express what it was that, who, who they were. They were not people that should be thrown away. And um, this, this project is, has been incredible for over 30 years. Suzanne Lacey, one of my heroes, um, she was, she developed the whole concept of new genre of public art. In other words, thinking of public art as something that isn't just um, a sculpture plumped down in the middle of a 
parking lot or next to a building, but art in the public interest, art that will actually bring public issues to the fore. And I chose her project um, called Three Weeks in May uh, to, uh, to underscore here from 1977. It was recently reproduced uh, as part of a huge uh, art project out in California called um, uh, Pacific Standard Time, uh, organized by the Getty Museum. So that gives you some idea of how important uh, Suzanne Lacey continues to be uh, as an artist and as a thinker. This particular project, if you look down in the this, in this area right here, this, this is the map of Los Angeles. And you can see that you can barely see the city because it has so many stamps that say rape. And rape, that's how many rapes have happened in Los Angeles over a three-week period, three weeks in May. So essentially what she's doing here is she's bringing to visibility a nasty, horrible reality that all women unfortunately still face is the fear of being sexually um, attacked at any point in time. And essentially what's happened with the map is the map is of Los Angeles, which we like to think of as the place of the stars, of the beautiful um, landscape, swamp too, but, but it, it's, it's glossy, it's entertainment, it's you know all the good stuff. This is a very different view of Los Angeles. And again, bringing things from invisibility to visibility. The book on the left is her book, I highly recommend it, uh, about new genre public art. It's, it's now a classic. Um, I think you might, not, you might not even be in print anymore, and it might have to get it um, other ways online. Newton and Helen uh, Mayor Harrison in extremely important pioneers of eco art. Um, these two projects kind of explain uh, at two ends, but they're still, they're still alive, and they've actually started an eco art project at the University of California in Santa Cruz, one of the few in the world where you can go as an artist and learn to be uh, an eco artist. Just started this past year, but it looks like it's going to be a very exciting one. Um, on the left is Portable Orchard. So again, the whole issue about where we grow food, uh, what it's all about, what kind of pesticides are being used on it, and so forth. They brought the orchard into the gallery so that people would have a chance to, who are not the urban people, would have a chance to actually engage with the plant uh, material that produces food for us. On the right, probably looks like something you're very familiar with because green roofs are becoming much more and more popular right now. But this was a green roof that was done in the late 1990s, not because uh, the museum where they did it were trying to reduce their air conditioning costs, which is the reason why most green roofs are being done now today, but because, again, Europe is deforested and it has no um, meadows. The meadows are now gone. Um, and so what they did was they recreated a meadow on top of the museum. So there. So what is the art today? Um, the artists that are practicing today are working and intervening in five main areas, in soil and food, in energy, in habitat, in water, and in species. And the first one I want to show you is about energy. This is Sarah Hall, she's a Canadian artist. And what she does is she makes stained glass, a huge stained glass window, public art, that has embedded in it photovoltaic elements that gather energy from the sun and light the building behind it. These are two of her projects. In the area of habitat, Lynn Hall from Colorado, a pioneer in developing habitat sculptures in areas where natural, native 
of natural restoration is taking place. Very often, in, well, we see a lot of that going on here, where you um, exotic invasives are taken down, and then the proper native plants are put up. This is being done as part of um, Everglades restoration uh, to a very great degree. Problem is that you can't afford to put in a huge 50-foot native tree where you've taken down a 50-foot melaleuca uh, or uh, an Australian pine. So what's being put in are small, tiny little uh, trees, and it takes anywhere up to 20 years for these trees to grow to full maturity so that they can then become habitat. So what Lynn has done, and she's not worked in Florida, but she has worked um, primarily in, uh, in the West. She lives in Colorado. And what she does is she goes into situations where this has happened, and she puts up these wonderful sculptures that are specifically designed with biologists to act as uh, habitat for the, um, for the animals while the other plants are growing up. And Jesse Edelson is um, a protege of, of, of Lynn's as well, and is doing a similar kind of work here in Florida. We're very glad that he's involved. Yes? Be a something ship or, or you know, being used as a jetty for, for I mean, as a, what do you call it, a fish to come home? Coral reef, make a reef on, wouldn't that be considered like a habitat? Salt home, you don't see it, but you've got it. Was there an artist involved? Yeah. Just make her still, is that? Yeah. Would that fall into that category? Well, one of the things that Jesse's also doing, we'll be taking a look at some work, and if you want to hear more, I'm sure he's glad to tell you about it, is um, an oyster reef project in, in Martin County. Uh, where, which is being done as an EGOR project. But to answer your question, yes, I would say so, yes. Water. How critical water is and how critical it is to come in, right? This particular uh, project was done by Betsy Damon in China uh, at the turn of the century, right? At the end of the 20th, 20th century, the 21st century. She happened to be living there because her son was living there, was married to a Chinese woman, and she went to visit, and while she was there, she got all interested in you know, what the artists were doing and what was happening with water, and this particular location in Chengdu, China, was on the rivers of a very, very polluted, one of the most polluted rivers in China, and China has many polluted rivers, as I'm sure you've read. Um, so the city fathers decided that they wanted their mothers or whatever, people, spouses, <laughs> parents, um, decided that they wanted to tear down uh, the slums that were along the river and create a park. And uh, Betsy, being a very enterprising uh, artist, uh, got herself into that project, and this is what uh, actually um, resulted. And I'll tell you just quickly what you're looking at. So this is, this is the whole park as it was completed. The water is brought up through a, a, a water wheel and it goes into a settling uh, uh, pool here. Then it's channeled down through here and through wetlands, constructed wetlands, until it gets all the way to the end. And when it gets to the end, it's clean enough to drink. And you can see a couple of the, um, this, this is where the water goes in and starts to be clean. Um, and then goes into these uh, wetlands. Here are the children playing on this sculpture, which is at the end of the down here. It's all the way at the end. But these children are playing on the sculpture in the water that has been cleaned. Brandon Melody, one of my really favorite uh, current eco artists, um, he is, has been working since 1996 on uh, biologically based art. And I, I wanted to just say that, you know, the interesting thing to me about eco art is that are the visual languages that are being used by these artists. In this case, Brandon is using science as his visual language. So, whoops, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, I'm trying to do the, oh, 
there it is. Okay. This is the um, this is an exhibition. You get all of these are uh, animals that have uh, too many limbs or other kinds of anomalies. He's focused a lot of his attention on looking at them, and uh, he brings this scientific information into the art gallery. So again, making the invisible visible. I mean, how often do we have an opportunity? to actually see what we are what we are doing by throwing so many pesticides and so much poison into the environment. How often do we actually have a chance to see that? Scientists are looking at it every day. They have they have um, all kinds of reports sitting on a shelf that nobody looks at. Someone like Brandon comes along and he's both a biologist and he's an artist. And he does not only does the installations for the for the uh, here's another one here for the museum or the gallery, he takes people on field trips and they go out looking for uh, wildlife, insects, uh, and various kinds of wildlife um, that have anomalies, and they collect them and then they discuss them. So it's a community engagement project in addition to being science. So we have several languages. Language of community engagement, community organizing, the language of education, and the language of science, all being brought together under the rubric of eco art. I love this artist too, Amy Francis Dean. Uh, she grew up in the uh, agricultural fields in uh, Northern California, San Ysidro Valley. Her father was the head of a very large farming concern that was industrial farming. So she actually grew up um, probably drinking bad water and being surrounded by pesticides as well and became quite an activist as a result. But again, we have here, uh, here we, are, we see an artist using the language of farming to bring farming to, um, to our visibility. Because farms, you know, Unless you live out in the glades, how many of us are actually aware of what kind of farming is going on and, and actually seeing it? So in uh, 2006, Amy put together a uh, book. What did I do? Oh, what did I just I, I put my, I put my, uh, my elbow on there. Yeah, OK. So, um, so essentially what she did was she took, she fitted out a, a big truck and it runs on um, vegetable oil from, that's left over from restaurants. And for two years, she and her buddies, her buddy artists, went around and these are some of the things that they had with them. These are the, the farming costumes that they wore and here's, here's one of the wheelbarrows. And, and there was always a little exhibition that happened everywhere they went. But essentially what they did was they set up temporary vegetable gardens. Um, this particular one was done at the Democratic National Convention in 2008. So again, making the invisible visible and in locations that are surprising, that are locations of power, you know, so that not only you and I and other sort of normal everyday people will learn about it, but the people who run our country will also learn about it. So Amy Franceschini is a real jewel. So now we're going to take a look at Eagle Art in South Florida, and I've you know, harassed you enough with the definition, so I, I'm not going to quiz you, but you know, you might take a look at the little cards I have around, because those of you who are writing papers, you can take that definition right off of there and put it right in your paper, and I know your professor will be thrilled with that. Uh, so I won't go into that more, but one thing I did want you to see was this. This is a little Venn diagram I did, because one of the things that has happened in the last few years is that we are, we are seeing our buildings being transformed. Um, and it's primarily due to a number of organizations, including the U.S. Green Building Council, which provides uh, a certification process for buildings. 
And in this particular case, it isn't a building we're looking at, but a whole neighborhood. They have a certification process for neighborhoods now. And so I took that and brought it up to Ecolar. It's one of the things that USGBC and I are kind of negotiating right now. Like, when are you going to put Ecolar into this whole process? So, so we're hoping that that will happen soon. But if you look on the left, all of these, oh, here's the again. Um, okay, so here on the left, these are the green urban development elements, and you'll find those in the LEED certification, that's Leadership for Energy and Environmental Design. You'll also find it in the Florida Green Building Council's uh, categories for uh, giving certifications to buildings and so forth. So all of these things are, if you're going to have a green neighborhood certified by USGBC or the Florida Green Building Council, you have to go through all of those. You have to have all of those to a certain degree, one degree or another. And depending on how successful you are, you will get a silver, gold, or platinum status for your neighborhood. So what I did was, I said, okay, that's all very well and good, but how do we, how does EWAR fit into this? And basically, if you overlap it, and you say, okay, sculpture, murals, landscape design, glass mosaics, and uh, ceramics, electronic media, water features, and many, I could list of many, many more things that all, all of you all do when are artists. If you overlap that with this, many of these things can be, can be either singularly or together can help in being your floor and fauna and ecologies, can help water and mixed water infrastructure, can do stormwater management, can do heat island reduction, all the way down the list. Why not? Right? That's what we're promoting. And we're saying that all of these things are great, but they're hidden, right? They're not visible enough. You bring an artist in like Brandon or Amy or any of the others that I just showed you, and you say, applying your, techni your techniques, your artistic techniques to these problems and see what you come up with. That's what that's about. Okay, so, we've been to the roots, we've seen the branches, and now we're gonna look at the fruit in South Florida. The fruit of what we, are, we have done. So 2004 to the present, the very first EcoArt project in South Florida was this one, in West Palm Beach, where I live. Um, it was done by Jackie Parker and Angelo Cicciotti. It's called Elders Co. in Brer Park, and I encourage you to go down and take a look at it. And this is what it looked like. The central focal point of the project is this sculpture that is in a new retention pond. The park was, a uh, park bond was issued and the park was being redone because there was flooding in the neighborhoods. So they had to build a new retention pond. We all know the retention pond, right? Those rectangular, boring things that just have you know, grass bowed all around the big fence and other So, they contacted Jackie and Angela and said, come on down and help us do this very progressive in 2004. I mean, 2002, I think, is when it started in 2001. Uh, that was unheard of in Florida at that point. So the central focal point of the work is this piece right here, the sculpture. Um, it, it is a bio-sculpture in the sense that it has, and you can see here in the, the close-up and the detail, the, the plants and the mosses that are attached to the sides of the sculptures. The water is piped up over the top, filters down, and takes the water down the bottom and has a missing uh, function and um, is lighted at night, so it's a beautiful movie. It also has um, had a little garden that was on the side, and then there was also another lake where they developed a cypress island, which was to give um, the impression that you were close to the Everglades, which of course the Everglades came right up 
to um, this area, which is just short of the coastal beach, and it goes all the way down uh, the peninsula um, along the coast. So the Everglades came all the way up to that area. And it's called Elder's Cove because this area has had human habitation for thousands of years. And the Seminoles were very, very important in, uh, in this area uh, for, for many, many years prior to uh, the, uh, the advent of the uh, Europeans. So. so I'm just going to ask a question. Yeah. This is what it looks like now, thank heavens. 
after our five years and fifty thousand dollars that we raised by ourselves, the city did not give us any money. So again, you know, the whole issue of having these four projects is great. We also need to have more. Um, I'm going to run through these quickly. This is Xavier Cortada. He is a local artist. Um, he was working up, uh, around the whole issue of mangroves as important aspects that protect us from storm surge from, and provide habitat for our animals. And it's being profligately, they're being ripped up and cut down um, to a huge degree. Uh, which we're going to feel the, definitely feel the um, problem with that as we have sea rise with climate change. Um, we did another wonderful project, which was an urban reforestation project. Um, a tree, every, uh, his idea was we need to reforest one yard at a time. And he gave people little flags and said, I, uh, I retreat this. Uh, piece of land from nature and it's now spread really far he's from Miami but it's spread throughout South Florida and abroad. He's actually done these projects also in China, in Taiwan and in Europe. Uh, Michael Singer, also a local artist from Del Rey, very important artist. Um, he does not get the proper um, respect uh, here where he lives. Um, this project most people if you've been to West Palm Beach, you probably have been to Waterfront. How many people realized it was an important project? There you go. Um, no signage there that indicates that there was even the arts involved. Um, Michael was the principal designer for every single one of the elements that you see up there, including the, the new um, islands and the portal that goes out in the coastal. Um, this beautiful project, for those of you who want to take a tour of it, uh, we'll be doing a tour of Michael's project at the Seminole Casino in Brooklyn Creek on May 15th. It's 30 p.m., so come on and we'll explain all about that. It's about stormwater retrieval and use. The water comes off the roof through that beautiful um, biofiltration wall, goes down into a little area where it's clean, where the water can be plants goes into cisterns behind there and then it's used for irrigation. They're getting so much water that they're now beginning to say that they're going to be able to do a car wash. This is this is on the uh, this is in the casino's um, it's on the casino's uh, garage. Uh, this is Jesse Edelson, right over there. Uh, Jesse Edelson's project that we did last summer um, in uh, you know, on Torrey Island in Lake of the this project is continuing. We did a pilot in which Jesse developed these uh, uh, wildlife habitat sculptures and then planted around it according to the plant life that you would find on the, on the Everglades tree island. So using the biology of the Everglades tree island and also to provide an opportunity for uh, students, for local people, for visitors, for ecotourism to come into the area and learn about the wildlife. We did, um, we had a landscape architect working with us who did this little sketch of the, the, um, of the lagoon. This is where, this little piece up here is where the project was. We would like to see it continue all the way around here. We'd like to see areas over here for little shelters that can be used for um, vendors during festivals and so forth. So the people are on this side, the wildlife on the other, right? And then there's a little island in the middle. The whole area was completely covered with a pond apple uh, jungle initially, originally, and all but most of the pond apples are gone now. So the idea is to bring back the pond apples and create a little maze of boardwalks going around so people to experience uh, the incredible um, experience of being on that agenda. Another uh, local artist, Lucy Keshavars, actually became an eco-artist because of Eco Art South Florida. She was involved in the organization and I kept telling her you're an artist, you should become an eco-artist, and so she ended up 
working with her husband, who's a civil engineer, and their company, and it, it is a very, very original idea. This, if you can believe it, is a, is, oops, this is a dry retention pond. I mean, a dry retention area. You know what they look like. They're horrible, they're all, there's no down, there's a big fence around them. What she has done is she's piped the water um, here, up underneath the road, comes up and goes down, goes through this waterfall, and then follows this serpentine pattern, which is the kind of pattern that you need in order to clean water, and then goes back into the, the lake, the, the retention pond on the other side. Uh, it also, she also has gotten Audubon to designate it as an urban oasis, and which means that, um, that scientists, um, that citizen scientists are now involved and in going in there and counting birds and doing all kinds of things. So bringing, bringing uh, nature back into the urban environment, making it visible to people. So these are the ones that are in progress right now. They're not completed yet. This is Dan Michael Singer. Um, he got this project as a result of the Ecoware South Florida. We're very pleased to say this is with the Solid Waste Authority. He did all the designs for this uh, beautiful um, visitors uh, center, which has a little walkway that goes over so that people can actually observe uh, what's happening in this um, in the plant, which is um, recycling methane and using it to um, create energy. And uh, he was also responsible for developing the um, architecture of uh, the entire uh, project. It's in process now. About eight different companies are involved and, and uh, consultants are involved in working on this project. Um, and he's a principal designer, so he really needs to be recognized. Here we go, Jesse. So this is Jesse's project at uh, Stewart um, Boys and Girls Club, where he's developing a dry retention, uh, retention area into a uh, into an outdoor classroom. Um, this is one of the things he works out for that we really would like to see. It's insane that our children are indoors in our classrooms in our public schools during the very best weather that we have. They need to be outside, they need to be on soft land that isn't covered with concrete and asphalt. How can we expect them to appreciate our environment if they don't have opportunities to be outside, or they don't have to get in a bus and go someplace to see nature? They can see it right on their schoolyard. They should be able to see it on their schoolyard. So I know that Jesse would like to um, develop this further, both at the Boys and Girls Club and at a local school that's in uh, And this is another project that Jesse was working on. This was a, uh, this is the beginning of the um, Living Shoreline project in Stewart. This is a little drawing that he did. I love this charming drawing, just very charming. Um, where they're going to be developing a new boardwalk, and this is Jesse's idea of what needs to happen now. Nurse log habitats, before uh, sculptures that can be osprey platforms, and most importantly, the oyster reef, great water, great water islands that will be the large sculptures. This is another Mike uh, Xavier Cortada, also a local artist in Miami. He took the occasion of the 500th anniversary of the discovery of Florida by the Spanish to point out that a lot has happened to our landscape since the Spanish came and then everybody who came after them. And so what he has done is he has asked 500 artists to each choose a native flower because Juan Ponce de Leon, when he came here, said this is La Florida because it had so many flowers. So, Artists are involved, 500 artists. There are 500 schools involved that are planting 500 gardens. And this is Xavier's way, in a very uh, positive way, to point out and bring to visibility the fact that over the past 500 years, what has happened to Florida. Another 
another project by uh, Lucy Kashapars, the Eco Walk at Seahorn Cove in Boynton Beach. She's developing uh, some um, uh, things that will help um, people to, to understand butterflies. This is going to be a butterfly uh, garden. It's, it's one half mile long and 50 feet wide right along the, the, um, uh, the railroad. And um, it's going to connect to other green areas in, in Boynton Beach. Boynton is a very progressive city. Um, was one of the first in Florida to have uh, a green uh, ordinance. And it also has eco art written into the green ordinance, which we're very pleased about. No accident, by the way. I was involved in that. Um, so these are the planned collaborations. We are going to have a year of eco art workshops. This has been partially funded at the uh, Daring Estate in Cutler. This is to introduce uh, the, the Miami Arts um, communities to eco art as a, you know, as, as a practice that people should be considering uh, converting into, we hope. Um, another one is we're doing a countywide competition with the Miami Beach Botanical Garden to create hybrid shade sculptures that include living native plants and photovoltaics that will gather energy during the day and then we'll be uh, providing lighting for the, for the evening in the, in the garden. Uh, we also are working with the Coral Gables Museum, which is Miami's architectural museum, and we're going to be doing an exhibition with them of new project designs um, for integrating eco art uh, approaches to green building technologies into Miami build Miami's buildings and infrastructure works. We are also doing, uh, uh, going to do some intensive leadership training utilizing the social sculpture approach uh, developed by um, uh, the protege of Joseph Boyce on social sculpture for the Institute of Earthworm and University of the Trees. We're also doing it with all of those uh, people up there, all the various uh, collaborators. And um, the, the final one is the, the, a project we're going to do, be doing in Boynton Beach with a uh, soup kitchen, a, 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 a lead certified elementary school, the schoolhouse museum in the city of Boynton Beach. What a bunch of wonderful collaborators, eh? So what we're going to do is, is we're going to have a series of linked eco art organic food and native plant living libraries um, in each one of those areas um, where the community can come and learn about native plants and also um, gardening. So what we say in Florida, South Florida is that eco art works. And I just wanted to quickly read this a beautiful poem as an ending from the Hopi elders. It kind of is an answer to the questions that were raised at the very beginning uh, of the talk. There is a river flowing now very fast. It is so great and swift that there are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They are being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know that the river has its destination. We must let go of the shore, push off into the river, keep our heads above the water. At this time in our history, we are to take nothing personally, it's of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey come to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves, banish the word struggle from your attitude and vocabulary. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. We are the ones we have been waiting for. Thank you all so much for coming.
Well, as I said, we were looking there at the roots of the door. So the, some of the roots are, are this social practice. Because, for example, Jesse Edelson, who is here tonight, and I'm sure he can stay around for a little bit after if you want to talk to him about this more. But community engagement is a very crucial part of the door. In fact, we think that if, if a project doesn't have community engagement of some sort, it really is an ego art in the end. So it can be, the engagement can happen at any point on the spectrum. It can happen at the beginning, the middle, or the end, or all three. But it has to be there in some fashion. There has to be some kind of engagement with the community that helps us develop a sensitivity to the environment and a willingness and a, and a, a, a conviction that we must act. So we're here not about raising awareness, we're here about action. Okay, and that's what I think both Suzanne Lacey's project and John Malpete's project show us, that we can take action. And I think that that's really an important part of, of, um, of the, this new kind of art that we perhaps haven't seen in some other um, earlier parts, and even current, uh, current art. Anybody else? Answer all your questions? Yeah, go ahead. I was thinking when they were talking about the bar team and all that, isn't um, Michelle Obama kind of contributing to this idea of the bar planning, you know, the bar and then getting all the children involved and, you know, trying to get people to think more about eating healthy and keeping the food uh, organic? The question, if you didn't hear it, uh, was it, it, it hasn't Michelle Obama sort of helped to, to, to carry this for this idea of uh, you know, food safety and food, knowing where your food is coming from? Absolutely. I'm so proud of the, of the First Lady that she's taken that, this kind of um, approach. However, she's not the first. Um, and the eco artist, uh, Amy Franceschini, that I, sh I showed you, um, it would be an example. Uh, and there are many others that are doing uh, the work, the project that we hope to do in Point Beach is going to take uh, the learnings that we have gleaned from an incredible artist, Bonnie Shirk, out of San Francisco, who was one of the first people to do urban farming. And she did it in places where it wasn't allowed. You know, she was an outlaw. Okay, so there, and that, that goes back to the 1970s, so, you know, I don't think Michelle Obama was even, was she even born yet? I don't know. I don't think so. Or she was a very small child. So, I mean, it's wonderful that she is going forward, but I think as, you know, as this audience today needs to understand where the precedents are, what is, what is the flourishing that has happened since then, and how has that been connecting? I hope that's gotten across to you all tonight. You said there's still looking to Definitely. Yeah, we have not been very successful at that. So, all right. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. <laughs> yeah, please. I mean, my, I have the cards and my business cards are back there and some little brochures about the organization. If you would like to become, uh, to, to be on our mailing list, I put out an e-newsletter, you know, every, um, whatever, <laughs> several months, whenever I get around to it. Uh, but it's usually something important or interesting, I think. Uh, so if you want to be on that list, you email me and I'll put you on. Um, and of course, we're on Facebook. So you can look us up on Facebook, uh, be a fan. And your attention, please. The library of the resource center will be closing. They're closing us down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So anyway, I think, uh, is there anything else you're doing? I think I can keep talking for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, 
Yeah. I think there's a lot of artists interested in the economy, but not necessarily dedicated to all aspects of the economy. Like, you were depressed and the shuttle bomb is this equal? It is a form, but then you ask yourself, well, does she involve the artist in the thing? And these are how you kind of define, like, is it equal art? Is it, is it a science project? Is it a community project? Um, equal art plus means all three of these things to be present for it to be considered equal art. Otherwise, you might have uh, environmental art, or you might have social activism, not necessarily. The person that you just heard speaking is the chair of our Miami-Dade uh, Equal Art in South Florida Committee. Thank you very much, Bonnie Garasasi, for coming. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know if you what she had to say, but she was just basically sort of reiterating what I was saying about what the characteristics are of true Equal Art, as opposed to Linwood or you know, whatever else uh, is, is kind of out there. We would love to see Linwood artists uh, come into the fold. So please come. Yeah, Jesse. Well, I want to just respond to the, the, the lady who left. Um, she, her question was, why is it there more support for artists in South Florida? And I, I want to respond to that. And that's sort of a, for, as an equal artist and an artist, it's sort of a, a two-inch sword because on one hand, yeah, it's not like a huge art center in New York. I've got friends who went to art school there in New York right now. And, you know, they're, they're, they're got the finger on the pulse, right? They're, they're in the center of the activity of, of art forms. But they are telling me, Jesse, I love what you're doing down in South Florida. That is so awesome. We need stuff like that in New York City. <laughs> and so I think that the, the disadvantage is, yeah, there's not a, there, this isn't a huge art center yet. We're, we're trying to be more arts integrated. The, the other side is that for a new art form like people, where we can really step up and be like, yeah, well, we're the new art form. So if you want to fund a project, fund this. Whereas in older art centers, they're, they're locked into the old way, the gallery show. You know, uh, it's, it's harder for them to start the new trend. Whereas in a, a place like South Florida, you can kind of get the drum on. And that is Jesse Ellison. Very proud that Jesse went through our apprenticeship program. We'd love to see an apprenticeship program right here in Broward County. So uh, let's see what we can do. Kind of what I thought when I started it, yeah. <laughs> So Lisa, are we done here? Can we keep them up? Oh, okay. All right. There are so many opportunities, both in the social and environmental arena. You know, it's, I used to complain a lot about living here. Like, oh, man, there's nothing to do. You know, I want to be an artist. I need to go to Paris. I need to go to New York City. And now, I'm like, whoa, I'm really glad I'm here. Because there's, there's such an opportunity here. And I think what you'll see in the next 10 years is that these artists that are working in New York City and Paris around the world are going to be coming to South Florida wanting to do the next level of uh, art history. That's actually our point. There really is no place else in the country, or, well, there are a couple places in Europe where they're doing something similar to this. But there's no place else in the United States where they're doing this, where they're trying to make South Florida a center for people of art practice. We are it. You know, so I think that Jesse is correct in, in a way, you know, that if we can keep moving, look at the projects we have going already, isn't that great, you know? So if we can get some visibility for this, um, getting ready to do a film that's going to document all the projects um, in South Florida that we've done so far, and hopefully that will help us um, you know, keep getting more altitude so that we can, you know, get more understanding of what we've already, already accomplished. Because did you realize that in 2007, when I started this, there was one Eagle Art project completed and two underway. And now we have 16, almost 17. I mean, that's a lot in five years. And I, I, I think we need to be really proud of that. So I think I'm going to stop there, but I want to thank everybody for coming. Gosh, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'd love to come back sometime and 
love to work with you all on getting an eco art note started in Broward. That would be fantastic. So we'll keep working. Thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure.